That is Dan from the Science Looking at Iron Exchange Chromatography. The science understanding is going to look at uh, very similar to what we looked at for chromatography. We're just focusing on iron chromatography a bit. So we're going to look at how iron chromatography uses a stationary phase and a mobile phase to separate out the mixtures. Separation is usually based on ionic charges. And we're also going to look at some data from iron exchange chromatography and do some analysis of that. So the basis of ion exchange chromatography is the same as other chromatography. We're separating out substances based on the structure of the molecules. But in this case, we're focusing on charge specifically and mainly ionic charges, and but also some level of polarity too. So the way it works is you have a column that contains an ion exchange resin, and that resin can have a positive or a negative charge. Um, it will attract substances of the opposite charge to it. So here we have a positively charged resin, it will attract negatively charged substances, and vice versa. So here we have a negative charged um, resin, it will attract substances of a positive charge. How readily your substance sticks to the resin it depends on the level of charge, um, and that's useful for separating out the substances. This is very handy in biology because proteins have areas that have positive or negative charge often, or they have just levels of high polarity, so high polar, highly polar positive and negative ends. It's also handy for drug molecules that can have positive and negative ends as well. Um, it's used for DNA. DNA is an acid, so it produces a negative charge, so it's very useful for separating out small amounts of DNA too. So let's look at some examples of ion exchange resins. Um, here's a zeolite down here, that's what it looks like, it's kind of fluffy uh, orange balls. Um, different resins have different charges, and their name is based on their chemical structure usually. Um, so let's have a look at some of these structures. So here's Q. This is Q here. Um, it's got a positive charge. See this N positive? That's the N positive here. Um, that means it's very good at attracting negatively charged substances because it has a positive, positive charge. Negatively, negatively charged substances stick to it. Similarly, DEAE, which is over here, we can see, again, it's got a positive charge, so it's good at sticking on uh, uh, negatively charged substances. There are ones that attract the other. So if it has a negative charge, it's going to attract um, cations, so positively charged ions. The level to which they attract is all down to structure and how many polar groups and also the strength of the charge um, on the bit that's hanging off of the resin. So we can see there's slight differences here and that's useful for separating out different substances. So the way this works comes down to equilibrium. So it, a lot of Le Chatelier's principle applies here. Um, the idea is there's an equilibrium between what is in the solution flowing through the column and what is attached to the resin. So let's have a look at this picture example here. Here's the equilibrium we've got set up. So we have a resin that has a positive charge and it's attracting negatively charged substances. In this case, we have hydroxide ions and chloride ions. And there's an equilibrium set up in the column between what is attached and what is floating in solution. And this can be uh, determined and changed by changing things like the pH of the solution that's flowing through. So if we want uh, chloride ions to stick to the resin rather than hydroxide ions, we need to remove the hydroxide ions because that will lead to uh, more of the chloride ions sticking to the resin. And we could do that by changing the pH of the solution flowing through. So if we made the solution flowing through acidic, it would remove hydroxide ions. Because we've removed this, the position of equilibrium will shift to this direction, and we would lead, uh, end up with more chloride ions stuck to the uh, resin than hydroxide ions. And that's the basis of the equilibrium that's set up, and that applies to all ion exchange um, situations. There's an equilibrium between what's in the solution and what's attached to the resin, and we're modifying that. So the level of charge that a substance has determines how uh, strongly it will hold on to the resin. So if something has a weak charge, it won't hold onto the resin as strongly as something with a strong charge. So here's a nice picture that shows that. So here we have, uh, we've got a negative charged uh, resin molecule here. So we've got the negative hanging out. Here we have an orange ball with a charge of plus three. That's going to hold on really strongly to the ion exchange resin because it's got a full, well, three full positive charges. So that's going to stick. Uh, this green one here has two full positive charges, so it's going to stick, but not as strongly as the one with three positive charges. Um, this neutral molecule has a positive end and a negative end, so there will be some attraction between the positive end and the negative, and this negatively charged particle, it won't be attracted at all. Because this has a negative charge, two negatives close to each other, they repel uh, through electrostatic repulsion, so that won't stick at all. Now, this is simplistic at full positive charges, but this can work for proteins too. Proteins can have levels of charge depending on what amino acids make up the protein, and that can be used to separate them out. So here we have, in this picture, we've got three different um, strengths of ions, uh, we've got beads, the ion exchange resin beads have a positive charge. The one that has the strongest charge is going to stick the most. So it will take the longest to come through the column. 
and that's how you separate it out. It's very similar to, uh, similar to column chromatography in that way. So the charge of the resin doesn't change, but you can change the components that you're passing through the column, and that can help you to separate out the mixtures. Um, if you increase the charge of the components in the mobile phase, so the solution flowing through, you can push components with lower charge out of the column um, faster. They're not going to adhere as strongly to the stationary phase, so the resin, so they'll come out faster from the mixture. Um, and we can do this by changing salt concentration or the pH of the solution that's flowing through, and that's often called a buffer. So here's an example down here where we have a, our column has uh, a negatively charged, uh, negative charges in it, and we're chucking in a sample mixture that has some proteins in it that have a negative charge. So the column itself would be positively charged, there's negative ions that stuck to the column. As we put in our mixture, we get the substances um, sticking to it. So our ions that are negatively charged are sticking to the positive column, and we're getting an equilibrium established between the, uh, the protein, which is the yellow down here, sticking, and also the other salts, the anions, negative ions that are sticking as well. But they're all stuck on the column, so how do we separate them out? If we chuck in some more negative charges, then a substance with uh, negative charge will be displaced by some of these. So if the polarity of these is higher than the protein, the protein will come out um, and pass out and elute out of the column. So that's a way of separating out. By flooding the column with strong negatively charged substances, those that have a weaker negative charge will flow through. And we can use that to separate it out. So let's look at displacement using salt. So here we have a mixture that has um, some pink, some purple, and some blue. So these are substances with different polarities. So they're put into the column with a low salt buffer. Um, and then they start to separate out. So we get the separation happening, and our substance with the lowest charge will come out first. So that will come out. And depending on what the uh, ion exchange resin is, it could be positive or negative. It doesn't really matter for this example. Um, then our purple is kind of stuck in there, and we can't really get it out. So the way we could separate out the purple and the blue is we put in a high salt solution. That high salt solution will mean that the substance that has the least charge, in this case it's the purple here, that'll start to be pushed out more than the blue will, which has a higher charge. So then we get a sample of the purple, then we get some of our high salt buffer coming up, and then we'll get our blue out eventually. So by changing the concentration of the salt in the buffer solution that's flowing through, we can push through the different substances. So here's an example using aluminium ions and potassium ions. So we have our solid resin, and it's got some potassium ions stuck to it, and it's in a solution with some aluminium ions, and we're getting exchanged between those. Now the potassium ions are going to hold on to the resin, because the resin has a negative charge, but the aluminium ions have three, uh, full three positive charge, so they've got three plus charge versus one plus for the potassium. So what will happen is the aluminium ions will displace the potassium ions because they have a higher charge and they will stick to the resin more than the potassium ions will. And that way we can get the potassium ions going into solution and flowing through. This can work equally well with proteins. So a protein might have, proteins don't normally have areas with full positive charges, but they will have um, areas that have uh, partial positive charges. So that partial positively charged resin uh, protein will stick to the negatively charged resin down here. If we flood that uh, solution with potassium ions, then we'll get the uh, protein that has a positive charge being displaced by the full positive charge of the potassium ions. So then the protein will go into solution and the column will have the uh, potassium ions stuck to the uh, resin. That way we can get the protein coming through. We can also do this by, rather than just changing the concentration of salt solution, we can change the pH of a solution that's flowing through. Um, and we get similar breakups. So by changing the pH of the solution, you're going to change the uh, what's stuck to the resin. So here we have an example uh, using proteins. So here we have a protein mix, and by changing the pH, what we're measuring here is the retention time, the time taken for the substance to come out. So as we're changing the pH, we're starting to get different proteins coming out at different times. And as they elute, we can collect those samples, and then we can identify what those proteins are. So just by subtly changing the pH of the buffer that's flowing through, we can get different proteins being separated. The other way this can work is that by changing the pH, you can also change the structure of the protein, and that will make it either more or less polar. Um, by changing the pH, you can change parts of the protein that attract each other. So down here we have an example where we've got glutamic acid, which has a negative charge, being attracted to lysine with a positive charge. But if you change the pH by chucking in hydroxide ions, you neutralize that full um, positive charge from the lysine. So rather than attracting each other with full positive-negative charges, you get partial positive over here, and that's less strong attraction than if it was a full positive charge. So that means the protein would change shape. And if that changes shape, that means it has less polarity at a particular point, and that can make it flow through the column. So let's have a look at some questions. So we have an ion exchange resin in here. Uh, we have a column. We've got an anion exchange surface. So that means the uh, resin has a negative charge on the surface. So the question says, with reference to the diagram, explain the residue posi relative positions of the positive and negatively charged proteins as they move through the column. OK, so the positive charged protein is going to stick to the negative surface charge of the resin. So they will be stuck to the resin, and they won't come through the column very quickly. The negatively charged proteins, they have a negative charge. They're being repelled by the, pro uh, the resin, 
So they're not going to stick at all. So they will flow through the column relatively easily. So the negatively charged proteins are down the bottom because they're flowing out. They're not sticking to the uh, negatively charged resin. Uh, question two says, uh, proteins that have a net positive charge can be removed from the surface of the resin by passing a concentrated salt solution through the column as shown below in this equilibrium. Explain how an increase in the concentration of sodium ions results in the removal of proteins that have a net positive charge. So if we flush through a highly concentrated solution of sodium chloride, we're increasing the number of sodium ions that are present in the solution. So we're increasing this, and that forces our equilibrium to the right. So what that means is the protein that was stuck to the resin is now repla uh, being replaced by sodium ions, which will stick to the resin, which is what we have down here, and the protein will flow through. So by uh, increasing the concentration of the sodium ions, the equilibrium will shift to the right, we'll increase the concentration of the protein ions in the solution, and then they will flow through the column and be collected. Our last example question, it says, wastewater from a factory is being analyzed using ion exchange chromatography. The levels of various ions are being analyzed, and the results are shown below. So identify whether the ion exchange resin would have a positive or negative charge. If I look at all these uh, substances here, these are all negatively charged. And if I look at the question, it says anions. So if these are all negatively charged, that means that our resin would have to have a positive charge. Otherwise, these substances will just flow straight through. There'll be no separation. The second part of the question asks why the retention time of the bromide ions is lower than that of phosphate ions. If we have a look at our scale here, we've got bromide here, which is at about, I don't know, 8.5 minutes or so. And phosphate ions is 12, so it'd be about 13, 14. So that's about 13 minutes or so coming out. So the question is, why is there a difference? Um, bromide ions have a single negative charge. Phosphate ions, PO4, 3 minus, have a 3, neg uh, three minus charge. So um, the bromide ions will pass through quicker because they have a lower charge. They're not going to absorb as strongly onto the surface of the positively charged ion exchange resin, so they will flow out quicker. The uh, phosphate ions have a higher charge. They will absorb more strongly onto the ion exchange resin, which has a positive charge, so that will take them longer to pass through the column. So today on Flipping Science, we looked at ion exchange chromatography. That's it for today. See ya.